Well, I'm uh, welcome to Crystal Bridges virtual talk. Uh, we are representing uh, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, and welcome to uh, everyone who's joining us today uh, from wherever you may be. Um, my name is Rachel Johnson. I am an educator with our public programs department. And uh, I'm excited to introduce my colleague, uh, curatorial associate Larissa Randall. Um, Larissa and I have the pleasure today of uh, having a conversation with artist and sculptor Fred Eversley. Uh, Fred uh, was born in 1941 in New York. And right now you reside in between New York and California. Uh, oh, I'm in New York now. You're uh, full-time New York. Full -time. Uh, and you, uh, we have you in your studio slash office slash uh, a little bit of everything from, from what you were my, telling me. My office, my studio, I mean, it's six floors, a total of almost 12,000 square feet in the middle of Soho. Uh, and this is the building that Alice came to way back when mm -hmm. and picked out the uh, piece that was sitting in front of the window of my ground floor, uh, it's the, the front window, sitting in front of the front window. She walked in and picked it out and that was it. Uh, yeah, Larissa, um, the piece that Fred is referring to is Red Lens. Do we wanna go ahead and pull that up and yeah. dive in? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for that introduction. And Fred, thank you again for your time and for being here today. I know we would much prefer to all be in person, but it's great that we can at least connect on Zoom and celebrate your works that are on view in the Light Fantastic exhibition. So the Light Fantastic is a temporary exhibition at Crystal Bridges now. It's open through the end of May, 2022. Um, it's a free collection-based exhibition that has over um, 30 objects from over 27 artists like Fred here. So Fred has two works in the show. And we're going to talk a bit about that today. Um, but the reason why I'm so excited to talk to you today, Fred, is because the show is really a celebration of light in art. Um, and it really is also um, looking at different um, ways of making art that different artists across time from the 19th century today have used light as a material. Um, and I've heard so much from you about how light is an inspiration for you, but also how it plays into how people experience the objects. Um, so I'll move us forward now um, just to Big Red Lens. So many people have probably seen this work on view in our permanent collection galleries. Uh, it's the first work by Fred that entered the Crystal Bridges collection in 2010. Um, and Fred, I know you have a great story about it, so I'll turn it over to you. Well, the story is, is that the, uh, I can't remember his name right now, your first director mm -hmm. uh, uh, came by my studio. Uh, he was sent by uh, the registrar of the, of the Whitney Museum. Uh, he came by my studio and looked at the piece and loved it. And then uh, I think on the second visit came with Alice who loved the piece and they purchased the piece and it disappeared out of my house. Uh, this was a couple of years before the museum was built and the museum was built and I came down and spent, um, I don't know, I think almost five days or so in Bentonville uh joined the opening of the museum uh and it was in a uh, not in this location but in a gallery looking at an inner courtyard i can't remember but it's in the inner courtyard um uh, and this location is a much better location because it's uh, much more airy than the original location um uh, and uh i haven't i don't know what Crystal Bridges is right nowadays, but in those days, as you entered, it went through early art. I mean, uh, George Washington kind of, you know, I mean, early American art, and then uh, wrapped around over the bridge and then to the other side to contemporary art. And that was one of the most contemporary things in the museum at the time. 
Um, it's set up pretty similarly. The Red Lens is kind of the first, one of the first big contemporary pieces you see. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's on the bridge now. I mean, and in those days, there was nothing on the bridge, I don't believe. Mm -hmm. But that opened the show that I remember at least. Mm -hmm. Well, and Fred, I, I know, uh, I don't want to prod you too much, but um, I, one of my favorite things about this installation of the work is that you can kind of really get a sense of the transparency of it, right? Like this is our largest lens in the collection. Um, but I was wondering what you think about being able to see the water through it. I know water is something you've thought about a lot. No, no, no. I mean, I, I, luckily I had that experience in a few other locations also. Uh, uh, Crystal Bridges is, is nice in terms of the expansive window, the water, and the fact that there is another architectural object, but very far away. So it, you get a lot of different, the only thing you don't have in there are people swimming or something like that, right? Uh, I don't know if there's still, there used to be ducks and things in the pond. I don't know if there still are. Um, yeah, there's ducks and turtles sometimes I, I've yeah. witnessed. <laughs> so I used to have, I mean, I remember seeing, uh, Oh, uh, Fred, looks like you muted. Okay, there you go. There we go. Um, someone did something. I didn't do anything, so I don't know why I got muted. But um, uh, no, it's wonderful when birds uh, fly by, or you know, uh, there used to be some swans or something in the you know in the water. Mm -hmm. uh, that just is one more element. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I can't think of a better location in the world for one of my pieces than that window overlooking that pond. Oh, great. Um, well, and I know transparency is so important in many of your works. And um, the part of this location that I think really shows your work in the best light is the natural daylight sort of show like affects how people experience it, right? And so at night, someone will have a different experience than if you come see Big Red Lens during the day. And um, one great through line of the exhibition as artists from the 19th century today have kind of been looking to the sun and the moon for these like reflected light inspirations. So I was wondering um, how you think that shapes your work. The what, I, what shapes my work? Like your the experience of daylight versus nightlight, sort of. Well, I mean, what my work does, all of my work, the flat pieces, the lenses, they, they all change very drastically uh, with change of light from day to night, night to day, uh, uh, artificial light to natural, you know, to sunlight. Uh, and my work is, you know, especially the lenses, it's designed to suck people in. Uh, the buildings are all sucked into the center, but also my experience in all of my years is that people don't stand back and look at my work. They, they start back and then go forward and then walk back and they, they play all kinds of games. Uh, so my work ends up being not kinetic in terms of moving, but very kinetic in terms of the interaction with the spectator. And that I absolutely love. I absolutely love. I mean, just uh, last night, literally last night, I was on a Zoom call with a gallery in Seoul, Korea. Pace Gallery opened the... And they have two of my lenses, two of my smaller mm -hmm. lenses there. And oh my God, an hour, an hour easily moving these two lenses around uh, until we got the perfect, perfect location for them both. Uh, and the gallery opened probably an hour later to the public because mm -hmm. of the hour time difference, right? Right. Uh, 
or two hours later, it opened to the public. But we worked and worked and worked and worked and carried them around. I had five people, you know, changing lights and carrying the work around. One ended up in the window and, and as you walked in the front door. One ended up uh, in an inner room uh, uh, opposite a couple of other artists. Uh, and uh, it ended up being a perfect solution, but it took a, literally a, an hour and a half at least of the, you know these Chinese kids carrying the work around uh, and getting it just perfect. And then we got it perfect and I went out to eat. <laughs> right, uh, and there's a 13-hour time difference between uh, New York and Hong Kong uh, and, and Seoul, Korea. I haven't gotten any feedback yet, uh, at least not that I know of, of mm -hmm. how uh, the show was received by the public today. Well, but, I I think that's like the perfect sort of reflection on your work too, because it is so like. Um, predicated on time and how different people will experience it in different ways. And you touched a little bit about your kinetic works. And I want to point to one that is on view in the exhibition, um, Kinetic Black Hole. Um, so I was wondering, you know, if you could elaborate a little more about um, why you call these your kinetic works and also um, what kind of like expectations do you have for the viewer that is different than from some of your lenses? This piece is balanced so that it literally, with a small little shove to the side, locks back and forth. Our prep team agrees. <laughs> I agree. In the museum environment, I know you don't allow people to do this, obviously. <laughs> yes. But, you know, I mean, in someone's home, mm -hmm. or or whatever, it's meant to lock. Okay. Literally lock back and forth. And it locks quite a while until it comes, uh, I gotta click it again, until it, it finally comes to a state of arrest. Mm -hmm. I don't remember now if this is, this might be, Alice bought two small pieces for her own house. This might be one of the two small pieces. Yeah, it's a promise gift to Crystal Bridges. Uh, I only was in the house a couple of times. I think I took quick photographs in the house. But I don't know where those photographs are. So, um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it was a very good time because the architect, who was, I, I think, a Canadian guy, uh, or someone from, yeah, I don't know if he's Canadian or northern, uh, northern New York. Uh, he was there at the time. We spent a lot of time talking and a lot of time. Uh, and he, I know he was the same architect that did an extension recently. Um, we got to know each other quite well. And we talked a lot about my work. Uh, and um, yeah, so I mean, th that whole period of uh, that whole opening, uh, I met uh, all the Waltons, the whole family. Um, as I said, uh, one, uh, I guess Alice's brother, I think one year, young, just slightly younger than her, his wife uh, was uh, my ex-girlfriend's roommate here in New York, Delta Willis. It is a really small world. Yep. You know, with New York and Arkansas connected with both of the both of the sons, the two kids both spent a lot of time in New York. They both had girlfriends in New York at one time. So I, I used to hang out with them for a while, and then they eventually got married and both moved to Texas. And Alice's cousin is in LA. Uh, I can't think of her name right now, but I mean. Uh, she never ended up buying a piece, but uh, we spent a lot of time there. She had a large Terrell as you walked in the house. Uh, uh, I'm so glad you mentioned LA because one of my, my next question for you um, is about your time in California. So I know before you moved to New York, you were at California based for 50 years. <laughs> um, right. And it seems like, you know, 
I know there are, are so many different aspects of your process that relate to machinery and access to materials. So I was wondering how um, place, like where you are living and where you are working impacts um, the way you approach your sculpting. Well, the big red lens uh, was done on a turntable. Uh, uh, that's now in storage in LA. Uh, I haven't bought it from New York yet. I may never. It's a monster turntable uh, powered by a monster motor. And it is the turntable used for machining the casings of the atomic bombs that fell on Japan. So the turntable dates back to 1936. It was built for the Defense Department. Uh, after the war, uh, it sat outside in, the, in a, a scrapyard for God knows how many years. I mean, probably 30 years before I ended up tripping over it. I got them both for $50 each. I went to one of my collectors owned Gemini, the lithography house, but his real business was a forklift. And he sent the large truck down and took these two monster turntables to his factory downtown LA. And I went every day for maybe three months uh, and we built them, you know, the took them apart, cleaned them, we built them. And then he delivered them out to my studio in, in Venice. And I made this piece and all of the 40 inch pieces. And then the big 96 inch piece that's in Atlanta all came off that turntable. That turntable is still in Los Angeles, so I cannot make this size piece anymore right now. I don't know if I'll ever bring that big turntable out again uh, because it uh, uh, it had to go into the basement and uh, it's tricky getting something that heavy and big into the, this basement here. Uh, LA was all one floor. So uh, uh, the fact that I made this, no one ever, and I invented this whole technique of centrifugal casting of the plastic, uh, which causes the parabolic shape. And as far as I know, no artist in the world does makes art this way, except me. Uh, so it allows me to make very unique art. Uh, the par uh, par parabolic lens is, a, is the world's most perfect lens. And so, of course, it's, it's perfect being a single element as opposed to uh, spherical lenses where you have to use several pieces of glass to get the same effect. Um, and uh, again, I don't know if I, I haven't made a 40 inch piece probably in 10 years at least. Whoa. Uh, and I don't know if I'll ever make another 40 inch piece. You mentioned the parabolic centrifuge. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier when we were speaking, you had mentioned, uh, you told us a, a parable about Isaac Newton, and what? you told us about um, Isaac Newton. Yes. Uh, will, you, will you recount that story and how it kind of inspired you? Yes, I mean, Newton, I mean, it's called the bucket theory. Uh, you can Google it, it's very easy. Isaac Newton took a bucket of water this is 15 something or other, uh, and suspended it from a rope and then just spun the bucket around and it created a parabolic surface in the water that reflected the sky the way a, a parabolic lens or mirror reflects the sky. Uh, it concentrates all the energy to a single point. And People, I mean, it became a very famous, I mean, the Newton bucket theory is very famous. Uh, and in the 18th century, and 19th century, both, uh, astronomers used this to spin mercury about the, the vertical axis to create perfect mercury mirrors for telescopes. And the only problem is mercury vapors are very poisonous, so everyone died. So they stopped doing it, although they still do it a bit now because they now put a vacuum system around to suck the mercury face, uh, fumes away from uh, uh, human contact. Uh, and um, 
But anyway, I, I started at age, I don't know, 15 or 16, running experiments in my father's basement, spinning uh, pie pans of water and, and then jello uh, and creating a parabolic surface. So when I started making art, I did the same thing with, uh, with polyester resin. And it's the basis of uh, not all of my work, but maybe 80% of my work over my career. What did your parents think about you spinning jello and water <laughs> everywhere? Uh, my father was an engineer and he came down and liked the theory and explained to me everything. And uh, I mean, somehow, I don't know where, I actually have that copy of that original magazine somewhere. Um, and um, I just can't find it here now. It might still be, I have a lot of things in storage in California. And it might be in a file cabinet in California. Um, uh, I'm missing a lot of stuff, including my banjo, a lot of things. Anyway. Oh, man. Uh, I was going to ask you to play the banjo next. No, no. Just kidding. Unfortunately, it's in California. I haven't touched it in years. But I played it a lot in the old days uh, uh, in Washington Square Park with uh, Bob Dylan and uh, Bobby Zimmerman in those days. And, um, uh, I grew up in uh, hanging out in the village. Uh, after, after school, I went to Brooklyn Technical High School, engineering high school, the best in the country, uh, and then to Carnegie Mellon, uh, a very good engineering school. Um, so I am a graduate electrical engineer. Uh, and... Um, yeah, well, you're not... You're you're not just a graduate, you were worked as an engineer for many I years. Worked as an engineer, yeah. yes, for four years. Uh, do you want to tell us, you were telling me that you helped design some- I uh, designed the laboratories for NASA Houston for testing, doing the acoustical testing on the Gemini and Apollo uh, space capsules. And then uh, I was no longer there, but when they went to the moon, they used my laboratory uh, for, for the, those components also. Uh, even though I physically was no longer there, I was invited for years and years to launches and landings uh, at the Cape uh, and landings in California. Uh, and uh, so I got to meet a, a lot of astronauts and talk to a lot of astronauts. I got to talk to a lot of people that were phony astronauts, like Dr. Spock, right? Because uh, we all used to take buses up to the landings and uh, of the uh, of the space shuttle, uh, and uh, we sit on the bus and have a couple hours of talking on the way up and on the way down. And then I went to some of their parties. I went to some of my parties. Uh, and I maintain the connection between uh, engineering and art, uh, well, to this day. Um, and in 1977, I was appointed as the first artist in residence at the National Aerospace Museum. Uh, I spent three years there, 77 to 80. Um, I uh, was going to, continued uh, making uh, polyester pieces there, but they uh, ended up putting me in the studio, building a studio to my custom specifications in the basement of the National Aerospace Museum. And the only problem is, is the fumes from my casting plastic would fumigate the entire museum. So I, that's when I stopped doing for three years casting uh, polyester. And that's when I started making my laminated pieces. And I made a whole series of laminated acrylic pieces for about eight years or so. Uh, but it started at, at the Smithsonian because out of necessity. And um, uh, and then, you know, uh, I guess in the early, uh, late 80s, or yeah, late 80s, I started casting plastic again, polyester. And I'm still casting polyester now. My last show was a, a one-man show at uh, a gallery in Los Angeles with polyester. And I'm scheduled to have another one-man show at the same gallery opening a new space in New York. 
uh, in uh, eight months. And um, uh, I'm working on this large commission. I can't go into details, but I'm working on this large commission for West Palm Beach. And that involves in casting of, I'm not sure, in, in plastic and maybe also casting glass for the first time in my life. Uh, eight elements for a major, major, major commission. So, um, uh, and the final uh, results of all of that become apparent within the next month. So here's, this isn't a trick question. This is just a curiosity. Um, do you consider your art also scientific objects, like much like a lens to a telescope might be a science object? You know? uh, they are science objects. I mean, uh, most people use them as uh, objects of beauty. I mean, you know, uh, interest. Uh, uh, but I mean, they technically, I mean, a parabolic lens is a parabolic lens, mm -hmm. whether it be polished glass or acrylic uh, or polyester. So, I mean, they're both, they're both a scientifically perfect uh, lens and a, uh, a work of art. Yeah, I love that. Sometimes... I mean, that piece you have, the red piece, is actually balanced. I know you don't allow people to do it, and I agree with you, but it's actually meant to rock. That piece will rock because it's thinner at the top than at the bottom. And in the studio, it, I let it rock in my stone studio. The museum never let it rock. And I understand why. And, you know, because if people will push it too aggressively and then it's all over, so. You, you did talk, a, a mention a little bit about um, how the viewer interacts with your work, even if they can't physically interact with it. Um, what, when, when you make a, a lens and that lens is channeling light and energy, what do you hope that someone in its physical presence gets out of that? Well, it plays games with the environment. Unfortunately, I understand why for practical reasons, you have it set on a pedestal against, close to a window against me. But I mean, most of my pieces are out in the middle of a room. Uh, and so you approach it from, because it's very different from looking at it from the back than the front, very different. And it's very different with people looking, playing games with each other on both sides of the piece, which is what happens normally. Uh, in a museum environment, you're a lot more limited, except you had the uh, museum environments uh, in Germany and England, uh, uh, such, I mean, where you have a big enough room that stanchions around and such uh, that, well, actually right now in Copenhagen, there's a major 40 inch piece in a show at the Copenhagen Contemporary. And there you can walk all the way around the piece. Uh, and they have sort of this roped off areas where you're not supposed to, not rope, it's tape on the floor that you're not supposed to cross. There's someone, an attendant standing in the room to make sure you people don't get too close to it. But there, people go all the way around and look at each other and play games with each other, which is what's supposed to happen even here. It's just not practical in your museum the way it's shown. I hear you, Fred, I do. Um, and my favorite thing about your work is how when you move around it, you have a different experience every time. Um, and then, so I'm presenting and two different views of Blue Para here from 2004. And it's like a different shape than the lenses we've been talking about. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about um, like what this shift in sort of presentation meant for you. Well, the outer curved surface at the bottom is a perfect parabola. Right. The top surface on this piece is a perfect flat. And so you get the image, you get what happens when you have uh, a perfect flat surface on a perfect parabola. I've done pieces like this that are parabolic, both surfaces parabolic. 
You get it by taking the same mold and spinning it. And there is a very different kind of image. Uh, and then I've done it with parabolic on both sides. So, it, you know, uh, and it, it's a total, it's, it is what it is. I mean, I can't describe it. I mean, visually, I mean, uh, you walk in and you see the reflection. Uh, it captures the above, the, uh, the ambience in itself and, you know, and reflects it out in, in, in a very unique way. It almost looks kind of like a, it, it, in real life, it's kind of a clear, uh, not quite opaque blue, but here it almost looks mirror-like too, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, you can kind of see the reflection here in one of the installation shots. And here you have it in a very low light situation mm -hmm. uh, with the big uh, neon. Um, and frankly, I've never seen it in that kind of an environment before. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> I'm sure it's interesting, uh, but it's very different than anything and then it's never been shown before that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's also very low, um, which is interesting because- oh, low is normal, that's okay. But mm -hmm. I mean, the, with, with that kind of very uh, red, bright red light, uh, it's a whole other experience. Mm -hmm. It's nothing like I've ever seen before. It is a very mm -hmm. dramatic experience in there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you tell you did tell us a few stories about your time with Alice, and I um, know that in general, Fred, you're just a very like social person and a social artist, and you're always like working within the networks, like the group of astronauts, real astronauts you were talking about earlier, and I know you're in a fraternity. So I do want to ask, like, has your work kind of shifted in any way due to the ongoing pandemic. It's been a long period of isolation for many folks, so. Yes, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. Level one, prior, uh, just prior actually, to the pandemic, I uh, lost my California studio. I moved full time back to New York. I have about uh, half of my machinery here. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, I have not done a flat piece since I've been here. Oh. Uh, I have done lenses. Uh, I haven't done a 40 inch lens. Alice has one of the very last 40 inch lenses I've done. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I've done uh, 24 inch lenses. Uh, the, um, uh, I am lucky in that, number one, I have all these major shows coming up right. uh, that started before the pandemic, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, uh, and I have everything I sort of need in my own building. So, uh, and I have uh, five restaurants uh, within one block. Uh, that is a gift. <laughs> and a good this and a good that. So, I mean, uh, it was very, very easy and a lot of work to do, I mean. So it was very, very easy for me to virtually um, avoid going out more than a couple of times a week. And then you just walk to the corner to mail a letter or go to the restaurant. And I'm talking maybe a hundred steps, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, either this way or that way. I mean, you have on both sides. Um, and um, and then, you know, I am quadruple vaccinated. I got more vaccine than anyone in the world. And <laughs> grab a mask and everything. And between uh, not having that much exposure outdoors and, uh, and uh, you know, taking good, uh, precautions when I do go out. Um, 
Uh, I just, we've gotten a lot of work done. Okay. You know, I, a lot of work done uh, on the building, on, on, on work, on, uh, on the book, it's book sick forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, I've gotten a lot of work done. I mean, uh, I spent very little time uh, going out. Uh, I spent yeah. a lot of time uh, on the phone, talking to friends and this, that, the other, all over the world, uh, using WhatsApp or one of those kinds of Skype or something. Uh, so I'm very connected to uh, everyone around. Um, and uh, people I haven't seen in 30 years are all connected again. Uh, and um, so it, it's, 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 you know, I've been affected less than most people because I mean, I do work. Uh, just today, I mean, uh, we packed uh, four pieces up or five pieces up. I came and took them. Uh, about an hour ago, while we, I was actually here, my wife went down, uh, and they're being delivered to California on Wednesday. And uh, my assistant, my old assistant in California, who's been working on and off with me for thirty years, uh, will polish them and uh, send them back to me, and I'll tell them. And uh, 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 so I've been affected much less than most other people by the pandemic, much okay. less. You know, I didn't have a job that I was, uh, I didn't have a whole bunch of employees that, you know, couldn't come. Mm -hmm. The two employees I had uh, over the over the year, uh, to a year and a half, uh, uh, fully vaccinated, and they cut, do come when I need them, which isn't very often. And basically, it's myself and my wife just working on all of these shows and all of this art and, uh, and uh, big projects for the future. And, uh, uh, you know, the people from the museums in California coming uh, and spending a week here, uh, going through all of my records, all of my everything. Uh, it's been three trips to that already. Uh, so that's three weeks out of my life where just, uh, you know, going through stuff with people uh, from the Getty, from the various museums. Um, and uh, having a little dental work done with the same thing <laughs> I was going to, right? Or goes to. So yeah. uh, I don't think she knows that, but I mean, maybe she does. Um, and uh, uh, he's one of the very best dentists in the country. So uh, she comes up from Arkansas. I, I love that you say you're quadruple vax, you have all the vaccines, because it just points like to yet another intersection you have of how your scientific knowledge and interests intersects with your artistic practice. Um, Rachel, I do want to give you the mic for a minute if you want to answer any questions from the chat. Um, would you, we had one question. Um, would you ever consider coming back down to Arkansas? Uh, sure. To sure, absolutely. I mean, I won't do it while this uh, pandemic is going on. Right. Uh, uh, Arkansas is not the safest place to be. My old roommate from college is still in Arkansas, uh, in the northwest corner. Uh, lockdown, he's actually had it. In, recovered from it. Uh, and he's locked down and, uh, you know, lives on a small little farm. He used to run a major hardware store. Um, and uh, he came down for my opening at Crystal Bridges. Uh, I met Alice and such, but he's up doing his thing. Uh, one of the most brilliant scientists I know. That's, uh, that's so special that you have, you know, a longtime friend who's living in the same space as some of your artwork. Yeah, I mean, oh, I mean we were roommates my freshman year of college. That's I awesome. I've been this for four years. Yeah, you know, started in 1959, my God. Wow. I mean, that's awesome. It's, it, it really is, everything is very interconnected. Um, you mentioned uh, how you've been in the process of writing a book 
uh, you you have several publications coming out soon, right? Do you want to tell us about those? I'm not writing a book. No, no, no. I mean, oh, this, my your, a book of your work is coming out. Uh, my dad only just put this book out, right? Uh, and the uh, Copenhagen Museum is putting a major book out. Uh, the Benton Museum in Arkansas, I mean, in California, is putting a major book out. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's something else. I mean, I just got this thing yesterday, literally. I mean, it's uh, whatever, uh, 50 oh, yeah. pages from a woman named Daniel Steen. Uh, and it's for the National Museum of American Art. And she's, uh, I just haven't, I just finished reading it five minutes ago. <laughs> well, we'll keep an eye out for that too. It sounds like if people want to read up on you, they've got lots of places to do so. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I can try to send this to you. I don't know if I am allowed to. I'll, I'll oh, that's, it. <laughs> that's okay, Fred. Uh, and uh, uh, no, and Crystal Bridges is a place that, you know, I mean, uh, they wanted me to actually uh, be in the show a couple of years ago, three years ago or so, uh, with someone I don't respect at all. Uh, so I didn't even, I, it wasn't even an issue. Uh, he's a cologne, I mean, I don't know if you know. But anyway, um, and, uh, uh, and there aren't that many people I can really say I don't respect because, so, you know, someone who just happens to be very rich and rich rips everyone off, right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, I don't know if there's a piece that left at her, if you have a piece of that in the, in the museum. Well, we're really glad that you were willing to be exhibited in the light. Fantastic is certainly one of the centerpieces of the exhibition. And I know guests have loved it so far. Um, and we are gonna continue to have them on view until May 30th. Fantastic. Um, Fantastic. I don't think I'll get down there before then, unfortunately. I, I, I close, respect that. When does it close? May 30th? I somehow, I mean, I, I'm so, <laughs> I am so incredibly, because I'm starting a whole new series of work. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very experimental and, um, Ooh. Uh, and I got these two major museum shows I got to get together. I mean, you know, I mean, just, <laughs> Uh, and literally, I mean, they just changed curators on me for one museum show. So this new curator wants to come and spend the week here going through everything. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, it's just, it's gonna be a month from now before I, I have enough time to even let it come. Uh, well, I'm really glad you took some time this afternoon to hang out with this curator <laughs> on Zoom. Well, because I mean, I think Crystal Bridges is one of the most important museums in the country. I'm saying that very legitimately. Oh my I, gosh! <laughs> yeah. I follow the you know the magazine and such. Uh, that location, your location, is a location that desperately needed a thing like Crystal Bridges to happen. And I mean, it's really, it's a really special place. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. it and I mean, and Alice, I mean, I'm saying this very honestly, I haven't seen her in maybe five years or so, uh, is a very special person. I mean, that was my impression. Uh, we think so too. We do. And, uh, and her, her nephews, I mean, I mean, I haven't seen them yet. They all got married and everything. But I mean, you know, I mean, they were very nice. They used to hang out in New York a lot uh, before they all got married. Uh, and uh, so it was a very important, and it tied in at the same time with uh, Bill Clinton and uh, Hillary and, and uh, my, uh, my old uh, girlfriend, Delta Willis. And I mean, it all tied together, right? Very, very tightly. Uh, and, uh, uh, now things are spread out again. I mean, Delta is now in bad shape in Kenya, mm -hmm. right? you know, with a broken leg. And, 
Uh, and I mean, so, I mean, you know, things get, and Alice is cousin, I can't remember her name right now, and, and then okay. Angelus who has that major piece, uh, that major collection and such. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I think they're just kind of diluted from the original very close, quiet thing it was. Yeah, well, I, I just want to reiterate what Larissa said. Thank you so much, Fred, for your time. Um, I, I think we've got to wrap up, but anything, any any last last words uh, or last oh, thoughts I, I, you'd like? I, I said my piece, I think. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's That's been it's been delightful talking with you um, both right now and as we've been planning this. Um, you're getting some thank you shout outs in the chat. And um, we look forward to seeing all these new books and all these new shows and we'll keep our eye out for Fred Ever news from Fred Eversley this year. Thank you. Listen, will you please, uh, number one, send me a link so I can, whatever yes. and number two, send me an email address and I'll try to send some of this stuff to you. You are. Perfect. Thank you so much, Fred. <laughs> you know. Uh, Thanks again, Fred. You're yep. welcome. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. Have a great afternoon, Fred, and all of our attendees. Okay, wonderful. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao.